Okay, so, okay. So, so, so thank you very much. I mean, maybe I should start by correcting one thing Lothar said. He called himself the local organizer. Well, I would use the word main organizer. So if there, um, so I mean, should at any point someone start to thank the organizers that Lothar uh, deserves the main credit. Um, the rest of us were just um, helping along. Okay, so um, the goal of my lecture series is really to, um, as the title says, is to explain how to use um, stability conditions on derived categories um, in order to answer somehow um, a, a basic concrete questions in, in algebraic geometry. And I mean, as you can see already from this long sentence, there's a lot coming in. There's stability, there's derived categories, um, stability conditions, and then of course I also have to explain some context to the to the questions that I'm going to answer with the help of these techniques. But for today, I want to keep it completely elementary and just explain thoroughly the, the first building block um, of all that, which is the notion of slope stability in abelian categories. So, if, I mean, I, I'm really trying to make this talk as accessible as possible, so please, please stop me if anything is unclear. All right, so let's go right into, right into the definitions. Right, so I, for today, this will all, always play within one abelian category. And the examples I have in mind are, so example A would be that um, A is the category of coherent sheaves on a smooth algebraic curve. Smooth projective algebraic curve over some, over some field. Um, I mean, of course, you can do variants of that, so you could ask X to be uh, not necessarily smooth and perhaps um, reducible. Or you could, you could also think of um, Another example you could think of is where X is a non-complete surface. And A is the category of coherent sheaves with compact support. But I, I, today I'll really just focus on this, in, on this part A. But I mean, if what I'm doing today is too elementary for you, maybe you can think along the way how to generalize these things to cases A prime and B prime. Okay, and the other class of examples that I'll look at will be come from, from algebra. So um, let's start with the quiver. This is just a directed graph. Okay, so I could have, say, two vertices and then some arrows from here to here. I, or I could have maybe two arrows like this and one arrow back. And then A is the category of Q, representations of Q. So what it is, I mean, these are, if you want, these are just functors from this directed graph to vector spaces over your base field. So let's make this concrete. But so that's, of course, just a fancy way of saying you take um, some V, which consists of a VI for each vertex in my quiver. So um, yeah, I'll use the standard notation of Q0 is the set of vertices, and Q1 the set of errors. Right, so when I, um, and then um, 
a map fij from vi to vj for each arrow. from i to j in q1. Right, so for example here, for, for this curve, I would just specify two vector spaces and form, form maps between them, and it's easy to see that this forms an abelian category. So I think of, um, so, so this is my notation for an error. Right, so, so any error has a start point i and this end a start vertex i and an end vertex j. Um, yeah, so you. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's an abuse of notation. So really, the, right, this is a notation for this error, one of the errors with star point i and end point j. Right, and I could also add some, um, some set of relations. Right, so for example, in this, in this curve here, let's call this vector y and this, these two, x1 and x2, then I could do something, by relation I mean something like imposing, say, x1y equal x2y or y. Uh, sorry, I meant x1, y equals 0, equal x2, y, y, x1 equals 0, equal y, x2. Right, this would be a possible set of relations, and then you can also look at a um, set of representation where each such relation is sent to, is sent to 0. Right, I mean, for x1, there's a corresponding map between my vector spaces for y, and then the condition says, if I compose them, then I get a zero map in my representation. Okay, and so now the, um, the key definition is that a a central charge on A is a function from objects of A to complex numbers. So for each object, I get a complex number such that, so first of all, it is additive on short exact sequences. Right, so, so this is really equivalent to saying um, Z factors via via a group homomorphism um, that are also called Z by abuse of notation from the K group of A to C. But I mean, if you, if you don't know what the k-group is, you can basically re recover the definition of the k-group from the statement. Right? It's just a free abelian group generated by objects modular the relation whenever you have a short exact sequence, then the middle one is the sum of the left one and the right one. Okay, and this, the second condition is that if I take a non-zero object, then z of e is in the... Uh, is in the following semi-closed upper half plane. So I take the upper half plane union the negative real line, and I always denote this by this black bolt H, right? So in the complex plane, I allow negative real numbers and anything with positive imaginary part. Okay, and from once I have this, then I have, um, I can define the notion of phase. So phi of E is defined to be 1 over pi times the argument of this complex number Z of E. Of course, the argument is not well defined, and so, but I, it is well defined if I stipulate that it's in the semi closed interval between 0 and 1. 
Right? It's basically just the angle here if I have z of e, then phi of e is up to rescaling just the angle over here. Okay. Any, any questions so far? And so let me... Let me give examples. So when A is coherent sheaves on X, then well, I define my, I can define the central charge to be I times the rank of E minus the degree of E. Right, and so, I mean, I don't know whether all of you have seen the degree of an arbitrary coherent sheaves on, on, um, on curves. But I mean, somehow one thing you learn in the first algebraic geometry class is how to get from a line bundle to a degree. And basically this degree function is the unique extension of this degree function on line bundle so that it's additive on short exact sequences. So it's really uniquely determined by being the degree of line bundles that you know and being additive on short exact sequences. And for B, um, here now I have a bit of choices to make. So I pick a ZI in this sigma closed upper half plane for every vertex. And then I said um, Z of V to be equal to the sum over all vertices of um, zi times the dimension of vi. Right, and, and I mean, you should know that this is, these two cases are very different. Here, I, can, I have lots of choices to make. I mean, here I essentially made no choice. I mean, I can I could replace this i by any number in the upper complex number in the upper half plane, but it would turn out that this the, this doesn't actually change the notion of stability. Okay. Okay, and then you define um, um, an object of your abelian category is the um, semi-stable or stable if um, for all sub-objects and I should insist that they are proper sub-objects their slope is um, less than or equal or less than the, sl the slope of E or the phase of E. Right, so here I mean strictly less than phi of A, strictly less than phi of E for stability, and less than or equal for semi-stable. And I might sometimes also say um, slope, slope stable here. If, if it's clear what, what, uh, what Z I'm referring to. Okay, any, any questions on the definition so far? I mean, let me just give you some uh, cartoon sketches of motivations for this definition. There are, there are at least three, and let me, let me mention each of them a little bit. And so the first one is for boundedness of moduli spaces, say of coherent sheets. Right, so let's say we take um, a point X in my smooth projective curve. And now if you take um, EN to be the following vector bundle, you just take O of minus NX plus O of NX, then this has um, 
rank equal to and degree equal to zero. But, I mean, the number of global sections is just the number of global sections of this one, and this will go to infinity, right? But H0 of En will go to plus infinity as n goes to in plus infinity. And what this means is that there is no bounded family family parameterizing all, all coherent trees with these invariants. So even, even, even all vector bundles. with rank equal to and degree equal zero. Right, so, so what I mean by bounded family, I mean that there is a variety or a scheme of finite type that parameterizes all such, all such vector bundle with these two invariants. So why is that not possible? I mean, it's an, um, it's an, it's an exercise to see that if you had a bounded family, then, then the space of global sections, with the, the dimension of the global sections is always bounded in a bounded family. Right, and um, then the next motivation is the connection to differential geometry. Right, so here I have to assume that X is smooth, projective over C, and E is a vector bundle. Then E is slope stable if and only if it admits a um, a, a projectively flat flat um, irreducible unit unitary connection. unitary irreducible connection. Right, so that's a, a famous result from you know, already 50, more than 50 years old by um, Narasimhan um, and C. Chaudhry. Right, so, so, so whatever, this, whatever these, these words mean, that's really characterization of this purely algebraic notion in terms of the differential geometry of this vector model. So that alone is, is of course interesting by itself. And then, I mean, the third motivation is purely categorical. Because it, it, it organizes your, once you have a notion like slope stability, in some sense it organizes your, your abelian category. And that's what I'll focus on today. So of course, I mean, I won't say anything more about this one, but of course, later in this week, the relation to moduli spaces will become quite important. But for, that, for today, I'll ignore that completely. Okay, any, any questions? I mean, here is a um, crucial lemma. Namely, if you have a short exact sequence, A into E onto B, when this is, if this is a short exact sequence in A, then why this is you have to see cell properties. So either the phases are increasing or they are decreasing. Right, and phi of A less than phi of E is equivalent to phi of E less than phi of B. And the same with less than or equal. And instead of a proof, just 
let me draw the corresponding pictures. Right, so what if I look at the corresponding central charges? Well, remember that Z is additive on short exact sequences. So if I, if I look at the origin Z of A, Z of B, and Z of E, then these form a parallelogram by this additivity. And either this parallelogram is oriented like this, or it is oriented like this. Right, and so this corresponds to the situation where the phases are increasing, and this is corresponds to the situation where they, they are decreasing. Right, and, and note that, that for this lemma, this, this assumption that everything plays in the semi-close upper half plane is quite crucial, right? Because only that way you really have a well-defined parallelogram in here. I mean, otherwise, if Z of B would be allowed to move to the negative half plane, then this, these pictures wouldn't make sense anymore. Question. Yeah, so here, here Z, A has bigger phase than E, and here A has smaller phase than E. And if A has smaller phase than E, then B, E must also have smaller phase than B. Right, so this is this situation, which is the same as this situation, and this picture is when these two are not satisfied. Right here, I have phi of A less than phi of E less than phi of B. And here I have phi of E bigger than phi of E, bigger than phi of B. Right, and the claim is that it's not possible to have phi of A bigger than E and here less. That's because there's no picture that would match the situation. I mean, here it's a destabilizing subobject because it has, right here, E is not stable because phi of A is bigger than phi of E. The argument of A is bigger than the argument of E. And here it's not destabilizing. Right? So here E could possibly be stable as long as the picture is the same for all other ob subobjects as well. Right? I mean, the, the, the point is this isn't just this isn't just a picture in a two-dimensional vector space. It's a picture in C, in particular in the upper half plane of C, so there is an ordering like this, right? There is. Yeah, yeah, this, these are all, yes, yeah, 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 yes, okay. Okay, and then, I mean, basically, as a corollary of the previous lemma, um, maybe let me state this as an exercise, if you haven't seen this as before. If E and F, um, are Z my signal? And if um, phi of E is bigger than phi of F, then there are no harms from E to F. All right, so, um, so in this, in this complex upper half plane, right, I mean, all the, if I look, if I fix a phase phi and look at all the semi-stable objects of that phase, they'll all have central charge on one of these rays. And, right, my, my claim is somehow that these, this picture leads to a filtration of the abelian category. And what this lemma says is that in this picture, harms can only go this way. There are no harms from anything here to anything here. Okay, so that's, that's um, one part of the picture. And then the other half of that categorical picture is the existence of Hardon or Zimmern filtrations.
right? And the statement is in both example A and or A prime or A double prime and B or B prime, the following property holds for every for every object of my abelian category, there exists a a filtration, and let me add that this filtration is unique and functorial in a certain sense. So zero equal E zero, it's an increasing filtration. Such that um, so E I modular E I minus one is C semi stable. So all I and the phases are decreasing phi of E1 modular E0 is bigger than phi of E2 modular E1, and so on. Right, so, so in other words, um, um, any object can really be written as an extension, as an ordered extension of objects sitting in one of these slices. So, um, all right, so let me draw a second arrow here. X1, so this, but this X1 means something different than this hum, right? So this X1 means any object can be written as an X1, some are ordered in this way. In the short exact sequence, the one, the object further on the right is always, um, further on the right on, the, on this blackboard picture as well. Okay, and so what I'll do for, um, so this is crucial for all the applications of stability condition and wall crossing and so on. And since it's so central, I'll, I'll use most of the remaining time to, to give a sketch of the proof of the statement. And I'll, I'll focus on case A since case B is actually a little bit simpler. And I'll, I'll start with the following definition. So I'll define a convex subset of the complex plane. So H N Z called the Harun Zimmern polygon. So what is this? I take all Z of A for A is subobject of E. And here I should be clear that this maybe might well be a trivial subobject, either zero or the object itself. And then I take the convex hull of the set. Right, so um, let me sketch an example over here. Right, you have Z of E somewhere here, then if you twist Z of E by a, by a negative line bundle, say O of minus NX, then this will give you sub-objects with the same rank in smaller degrees, so they'll lie somewhere here, so all this is part of the, this convex hull. And then I may have some sub-objects with bigger face. And then I claim that this is a So the picture will, will look something like this. So this is called the um, hardon Zeman polygon. It's of course a bit of a misnomer since it's not bounded. But I claim that it is polyhedral on, on that is real, that it is a polygon on the left. Right, and so the um,
there's a simple lemma. So, right, I claim that h and z of e is bounded on the left. And so, um, to prove this, I mean, of course, that's equivalent. The claim is equivalent to saying that the degree of A, um, right, the degree of A for A a subobject of E is bounded above. Okay, so I mean, to some of you, of course, this statement may look obvious, but nevertheless, yet, let's think about what actually goes into the statement. Right, so what is the proof of this claim? Well, it holds for when E has um, rank equal to zero or rank equal to one. Right, so for rank equal to zero, the degree is just the length of a, of the, of a zero-dimensional sheaf, and the subsheaf certainly has smaller length. And for rank equal to one, again, I mean, this is actually a non-trivial statement. Right? I mean, that's essentially the statement that the degree of line bundles is well-defined, and if you have a subline bundle, then it has smaller degree. Right? And if you remember your first or second algebraic geometry course, it actually takes, takes a while to, to prove statements like this. Right, and then um, right, if you have a short exact sequence, and if the claim holds for E1 and E2, then it also holds for E. It just follows from the fact that if you have a subobject of E, then you get a corresponding subobject of E1 and of E2 that fits into short exact sequence. And so the degrees of the subobjects here are bounded, and by additivity on the short exact sequence, it follows that the degree of the subobject of E are bounded. Right, and then, then you can do induction on the rank. Right, I mean, in fact, any E has a a subobject as a line bundle, any torsion free sheaf as a subobject that is given by a line bundle. And so you have a short exact sequence like this where both this and this object have strictly smaller rank. Okay, so I mean, so far this was just a justification of this picture over here, right? I mean, H and Z of E is bounded on the left. And I mean, also all the central charges lie in this discrete lattice Z plus imaginary plus i times z, the Gaussian integers. And so uh, the left-hand side is really this, of this convex set is really um, just given by this, by this polygon. Right, and now, um, at, so let's look at these extremal points on the left. Right. Be the, I let this be the extremal points. Of H and Z, this Haran Simon polygon on the left. And so over here I would have um, Z0, Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. And then for each Um, I let E I be a subobject such that Z of E I um, is equal to Z I, right? And so I mean this exists ex exactly because Z I is extremal. Right, I defined H and Z of E as a convex whole of certain number of points, but since Z I is 
extrema in the set, it really had to be in the original set of Z of up sub-objects. So there exists a sub-object with this central charge. Right, and now my claim is that this is the heart of Zimmern filtration. Claim. This is No, I mean strictly extremo, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and yeah. I don't take anything here on this line. So. Right, and so, so this was lemma one that I had to prove. Um, lemma two. So now I'm trying to prove this claim. So here lemma two is that this is really filtration, right? So in fact, I'm claiming that EI minus one is a subobject of EI. How do you prove that? Well, I mean, the key thing is that in an abelian category, if you're given two subobjects of a given object, you can always form their intersection. And you can form their span. Right, so here I don't mean the direct sum of these two objects, I just mean the span inside the given subobject E. And um, right, and so then there is a short exact sequence A goes into EI minus one direct sum EI goes on to B. Right, in fact, I mean you have a natural map from this direct sum to E, and B is the image of that map, and A is the kernel of that map. That's how you see that this really has exists in any abelian category. And right, and so from this you see that the midpoint of um, the line segment from Z of A to Z of B is equal to the midpoint of the line segment from Z I minus one to Z I. So let's, let me draw a picture over here. A of Z I minus one, A of Z I. And the hadron simon polygon is somehow here to the right of this line segment because I chose two consecutive extremal points. Right, so, um, right, so you also have that Z of A and Z of B are in the hadron simon polygon. That's because they are subobjects of E. Right, and so if you combine these two statements, this is only possible if, um, right, so in particular, they are always to the right of this straight line. And either they are strictly on the right or on this line segment. And so if you combine this with the previous statement, this is only possible if Z of A and Z of B are on the line segment from the I minus one to the I. Right, but you also have that A is a subobject of the I minus one. Right, so this means that the rank of A or the imaginary part of, right, means that the imaginary part of Z of A is less than or equal to the imaginary part of Z of E I minus one. I mean, why is that? Because you can form the quotient and the quotient is contained in the same closed upper half plane. Right, and so, so all these statements together are only possible if Z of A is equal to Z of I, E I minus one, and if A is in fact isomorphic to EI minus one. But that's of course equivalent to, to the claim. Right, I've shown that the intersection of these two subobjects is isomorphic to EI minus one, which is the same as this inclusion. 
Okay. And um, So for now, I'm just proving the existence, so I don't have to answer that question. But actually, you can use basically the same argument that I used for the proof of lemma 2, two to show the uniqueness. I mean, so let, let me give that as an exercise, right? Um, so uniqueness. Of EI. And, and, and use that to show uniqueness of the Haran Zimmern filtration. Okay, so what do I still have to prove? I have to prove that EI modulo EI minus one is C semi stable. Proof. Assume otherwise. Well, I mean, any subobject of EI modulo EI minus one is of the form um, is of the following form, right? There exists an A that contains EI minus one and is contained in EI such that. Um, Right, so from this, of course, I get an inclusion of A modular EI minus 1 inside EI modular EI minus 1 and phi of A modular EI minus 1 is bigger than phi of EI minus 1, EI modular EI minus 1. Right, so far I've just written down what it would mean for this object not to be Z semi-stable. And let's draw a picture. All right, so here we have zero. Here, let's say here I have Zi minus one. Then right here I have Zi. Here again, I can form this parallelogram. So that here I get Z of Ei modulo Ei minus one. Okay, and let's look at where A would lie. Well, I know, I don't right know, know right away where Z of A would lie, but I know that Z of A modular EI minus one, right, this would have to lie somewhere here. It has bigger face than Z of EI modular EI minus one. It has to lie somewhere here on the left. And now, what does this mean for Z of A? Well, I mean, I have Z of A is equal to Zi minus one plus Z of A modular Ei minus one, right? That's again just coming from the additivity on short exact sequences. Right, so Z of A has to lie somewhere, somewhere up here. Again, that's a contradiction to That's a contradiction to um, Z of A, to the fact that Z of A lies in the Harlan Zimmern polygon and that Zi minus 1 and Zi are consecutive extremal points of this convex set. Right, okay, so I've shown, what have I shown? I've shown that I've gotten the filtration and I've shown that the quotients are semi stable. And finally, note that, I mean, all right, so of course, phi of E1 modular E0, that's just phi of C1 minus C0, phi of E2 modular E1 is equal to phi of C2 minus C1, 
and so on, and right, so just by the convexity, these numbers are decreasing. And so now I've proved, I've, I've proved at least the existence of Harron Zimmern filtrations. I won't, um, I won't say anything about the uniqueness. You know. Any, any questions? Sorry? Yeah, so here by phi, I mean the argument, again, the argument of this complex number normalized to be between zero and one. Yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, I've defined phi only for objects of A, but uh, again, I, I can do the same thing just with these, with these complex numbers. And maybe I should make a remark of what, what did we actually use? Right, so I used two things. Right, I used that minus the real part of Z of A um, is bounded above. For, for subobjects of E. And I use that the, right, if you look at the Z of all objects of A, I use that this is a, contained in a discrete set. Right, in, 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 um, in our case, because it was contained in Z plus IZ. But, but if you, Right, and so whenever you have these two properties, then you automatically get hadron zimmern filtrations. Right, these two together imply hadron zimmern filtrations. Because both of these imply, these two together imply that the hadron zimmern polygon is um, somehow this, has a finer polyhedral property on the left. But in fact, if you think about it a little bit more, actually I need a little bit less and um, in fact, sufficient if it's sufficient if um, the following Z, Z. If, if I look at all the Z of A's for which the real part of Z of A is less than or equal to the maximum of M0 and the real part of Z of E. If this is a finite set, then I'm good. Right? Because then, if I look at this hadron zimmern polygon, it always contains zero. Sorry? Uh, sorry, here I mean for all um, A subobjects of E. Yeah. Right, if you take, if you're given an object, right, if you're given an object E that has the property that this set here is finite, for all subobjects you look at Z of A as long as it satisfies this property, right, so anything that's on the left to one of these two numbers, because that already means that the Harner Zimmern polygon is really a polygon on the left. And then the same proof works. Okay, and in particular, it's easy to see that in this situation B that I started, that I mentioned earlier, hadron zimmern um, filtrations exist. Okay, and so I want to um, finish by um, discussing deformations a bit. Right, 
right? And so, so recall in example B, slope stability dependent on parameters. In other words, I could deform my notion of stability. And, and what I want to convince of, um, there's an example A, I, I, I really couldn't deform it, right? And so my claim one is that this is interesting. So I'll, I'll do this right now with an example, and then the um, claim two probably take tomorrow and Wednesday to justify is that this can be generalized. This deformation property can be generalized if we, um, if we use the derived category of A rather than only A. Okay, and so to, to, to justify my, my first claim that this is interesting, let me look at two examples. So A, I take the quiver with two vertices and two arrows. And B, I take um, the same quiver, but then I add one arrow going backwards. Right, so this is a quiver with, let me label the vertices as one and two. And maybe let me label the arrows here by x1 and x2, x1, x2, and y. And, um, right, and, and in both cases, right, so there are basically two situations for my choices. I mean, either um, Z1 is on the left and Z2 is on the right. So remember, for to choose the stability, I have to choose one complex number for each vertex. And I claim that there are just two situations to consider, namely whether D1 is on the left, or whether Z2 is, is on the left, having bigger face. Right, and so um, let's start with, um, and, and in both, in all of these cases, right, so there are now four cases, let's look at, um, let's look at table representations of dimension vector one one. But, uh, I wanted V one and V two are both one, right? So you can think of let's say we do all this over C. So they're both isomorphic to C, but of course not naturally isomorphic. And so maybe let's start with um two A. Right, so here, what is my representation? I have here C and C, both after rescaling. And I have two arrows like this, but this representation always has as a subobject the representation that has the zero vector space here and C over here. I mean, if you, if you look at the sub-representation, then this is clearly preserved by all the maps. And I mean, this one here has, um, this one here has center charge Z1 plus Z2. This one has the center charge equals to Z2, right? And so in this picture, you see that, um, right, so this is my V, and this shows that V is unstable.
And so here I have a, always I have always this, this simple representation just concentrated at the second vertex as a subobject. And so when the configuration is like this, then this is destabilizing. But what if instead we look at one A? And if, so first of all, any any questions on this example? For, so for one, for one A, again I have, right, I have C on the left and C on the right, and I have two, two maps, X1 and X, so for each arrow, I'll get the corresponding map from C to C. So when is this representation stable? Well, I mean, the, the only thing I have to verify is that the simple representation sitting on the left-hand vertex is not a sub-representation. Right? So this is stable. If and only if x1 is not equal to zero or x2 is not equal to zero. Right, and so if you look at the parameter space of all stable representations of this dimension vector, right, and this is isomorphic to C2 minus the origin. But then, I mean, you have to remember that this was the two vector spaces were only C up to isomorphism, and I can rescale them. And rescaling them, of course, corresponds to rescaling x1 and x2 by a common scalar, right? So I have to um, rescale by c star here, and so I get I get p1. So on the one hand, I have p1. In one way, I have p1 as a modular space. In the other, I, in the other case, I have um, the empty set as a moduli space. So here, the moduli space of stable representation of this dimension vector is just the empty set. Okay, so what happens in this example, in this example B? So I have C and C and I have two maps like this and I have one map like this and note that, I mean, both of these are C only up to isomorphism, but if you take the composition of two, two vectors so that you end up at the same vertex, then this is a well-defined endomorphism of a given one-dimensional vector space. So that's a complex number. Right? So, so in other words, you have a map from this moduli space of representations of dimension vector 1, 1, 2, A2, just given by sending V to say y, x1, and y, x2. Okay, so that, that part we always have. And now let's look at the two stability conditions. Right, so um, for um, 2b, right, so, so again here, um, This is the representation that is not allowed as a sub -represent. Right, and so, so what does this mean? This, mean? this just means that y is not equal to zero. Right, but, but if y is not equal to zero, then you can actually, I mean, up to this rescaling, you, you can just presume that, that y is equal to one. Right, and, and, and then this shows that from the image over here, x1 and x2 are determined. Right, so this moduli space of stable objects just becomes isomorphic to A2. 
And now what happens in example 2a? Right, again, now it's the, sim the simple representation concentrated on the left-hand side that's not allowed to be a, um, to, to be a, um, to be a sub-representation, right? So this means that x1 is not equal to zero or x2 is not equal to zero. Right, and so what does this mean? Let's look at what this means for this map to A2. So again, if the, if the image here is outside the origin, then there's a unique pre-image, right? Because then the same argument as before um, works. I mean, if the image here is not the origin, then Y cannot have been zero. And so X1 and X2 are determined by the image. Right? So this is isomorphism outside the origin. And now what is the pre-image of the origin? Well, right, if, if, if this map lands into the origin, then this, this means that either y0 or x1 and x2 are equal to zero. Well, x1 and x2 equal to zero is excluded. So in the other case, so over the origin, we get, I mean, y equal to zero. And so again, um, what do we remember? We have x1 not equal to zero, x2 not equal to zero. Uh, sorry, we have now x1. x1 and x2 are not both zero. But now we haven't used the rescaling yet, right? So we haven't done any normalization to C star, so the pre-image here is, is P1, right? If, so let me say that again, if I'm here, the image is the origin, then y must be equal to zero, and so the, the isomorphism type of the representation is again given just by the ratio of x1 and x2 up to rescale. Right, and so in other words, this is the, the blow up of A2 at the origin. Okay, and so I mean, I hope this example convinces you that something interesting happens when you, when you, you, know, when you vary stability and that it's worth doing the work of generalizing this, this deformation to other situations where, we'll, where we will we'll have to go to the derived category. Okay, thank you.